Welcome to Bible class. Um, members of St. Paul Lutheran Church and School and anyone else who is watching, in the midst of the current events, we are recording these. We are going to be putting them on YouTube and uh, doing our best to continue to get into God's Word together, to get into, um, get into discussion and all the other things we would normally do in person, but for now, for the safety of... Uh, of the population at large. We're going to be stepping back from that a little bit, but again, we do want to continue to get into God's Word. Um, so how I'm going to be going through this, and this is, of course, contingent upon uh, technology continuing to be agreeable with me, is I'm going to go through the Bible study just like I would if we were in person, if we were in a classroom together. Um, for those of you who have had me before, who have, who have sat in the classroom with me in a teaching role, you know that I rely a lot on discussion. I rely a lot on, on back and forth, and I obviously don't have that. This is not a video chat, this is a just a video. What I am going to do though is I am going to still pose those same questions, those discussion topics that I, I have prepared for us that I think are worth talking about and seeing how does this play out into our lives? What does this look like in the real world? I'm going to post those under the video as comments, as questions, as comments. And I would encourage you, as you watch this, they'll, they'll go in order. The comments will go in order of, of the video. And as you watch this, I would encourage you to pause the video, go down to those comments and, and put, put your thoughts. What are you thinking? What are you, uh, what's your reaction? Stuff like that. Um, and then we can still have uh, that discussion because I think we benefit greatly from that discussion. We learn more and I think we apply it more directly to our lives as we can reflect those ideas off one another. So that is the plan. That's what we're going to do going forward. And with that, we're going to charge forward into Revelation 12. If you are not a, a regular attendee of St. Paul's Bible Studies, Revelation 12 is obviously 12 chapters into the book of Revelation. Um, and at some point, it is my intention to, to maybe go back and do those first 11 chapters and get videos out for those. But as of right now, don't go crazy searching for them because they do not exist. Um, and that is as of 226 on March 16th, 2020. Um, but as we step into Revelation 12, here's where we're coming from is you see, in the first several chapters of Revelation, we have these letters to the churches that are advice, primarily intended to strengthen people's faith, and then to connect them to the, the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And then going from there, we step into these visions. And these visions are what I think a lot of people actually focus on when they talk about Revelation, because these visions are of the end of the world as we know it anyway, the end of time, the end of old creation, the new creation, however you want to dictate that, whatever you want to call that, that's what we're looking at. And those come in sevenfold images. So we start with seven seals, and then we move seven seals is in on the letter, seven, not seven seals is in the animal. And then we move to seven trumpets. And that's where we're stepping in here. You see, Revelation 12 is a pause between the seven trumpets and the next sevenfold vision that we'll get to in the future. And what is happening here is we're getting a, a brief and a, a not as detailed as we'd like description of what's happening kind of overarching all of these events, in reality overarching the entirety of Scripture. We're going to see things that happened before the fall, and we're going to see things that won't happen until the end of time. So, that's where we're stepping into, and what we're going to see is we're going to see a conflict between cosmic forces. And what this does is this dominates, and this controls, and this influences all the other events that we, we have read about, and that we're going to read about here in Revelation. So with that, I want to get into Revelation 12. 1 through 2. I'm going to be going to my trusty Bible here. I would encourage you to do the same. Um, and I'll also do my best. I'll have these verses up on the screen for you as well as we go through them. But we're going to step into Revelation 12, 1 and 2, where we see 
A great sign appearing in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. So as we go forward, this is speaking to uh, a woman uh, clothed in the brilliance of Christ. This is, this is a significant distinction that I want to make. She is not radiating this brilliance. She is clothed in it. The only people who are spoke, spoken of, of, of radiating brilliance like the sun is God, is, is Jesus, is, is the Father, etc., etc. So it, it's an important distinction that she is clothed in the sun. So she is being glorified by God, but she is not God in herself. Um, because this is this is a suggestion of glory and then we move forward and it says the moon has been placed under her feet so what this this language suggests is dominion when when we use phrases like the, the world has been put under his feet we're, we're speaking of dominion and control and authority so this is this is a lot of authority that's being given to this woman and there's also an association of the moon with surpassing beauty, with incredible beauty. So that's what we have going through as descriptions of this woman. And then she has a crown of 12 stars. A crown of 12 stars. Now, I want to I want to make a clarification. And, and if you've been in classes in person up to this point, you've heard this again and again. When we read the Bible, more often than not, the crown image is not the same image that we we tend to rely on today because when you and i speak of this today we speak of a crown as a a symbol as a signifier of royalty in these times though it's more associated with victory if you won in the arena if you you were a, a, a victor the victor took the crown so when we speak of she has a crown of 12 stars this is a this is a symbol of victory this is a joy, this is a victory, but it's not an association with royalty. And as we go forward, there, there's another, uh, I guess, instance where we're going to see a distinction. So hold on to that for a minute. Um, but there's victory, and you might say, well, why are, why, are there 12, um, why are there 12 stars? Well, the reason for that is that it's symbolic of God's people. Before the birth of the child that we're going to get to, it's the 12 tribes of Israel, and that's what this is signifying. But after the birth of the child, which, spoiler alert, it's Jesus, um, it switches to the 12 disciples. And it's representative of the, the New Testament church and, and of God's people under the New Covenant. Um, so that's what this, this crown of 12 stars is. It's victory for God's people. And... What I want to talk about this woman is there's no other human in the entirety of Scripture that is as glorified and honored as this woman is. Um, and this woman is symbolic of the church. When we talk about the church as the bride of Christ, that's the connection that's being made. And for those of you watching this, I do want to make you aware, people will try and make this connection to Mary. And that's not an unfair connection because she she's speaking, when we, when we read forward, the child that she gives birth to is the Messiah. Um, so there's a connection that's made to Mary. And like I said, it's not an unfair one, but I think what is more accurate here, what is more uh, consistent, would be to say this, is, this woman is symbolic of the entirety of the church. And the, when I speak of the church, I mean God's people. So that's what we're, we're speaking of going forward. And as we go forward, we're going to go into Revelation 12, 13, or 12, 3 to 6, and here's where it gets weird. Um, we have, and another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. So, that's what we have going forward, and um, there is a lot of symbolism here. 
If this is your first time with me, speaking of Revelation, I'm going to make the same disclaimer I make all the time. Um, I am non-committal when it comes to Revelation. There are a lot of people who are very certain that Revelation is solely symbolic, and that this dragon is only a symbol, and there's, there's never going to be any such thing as dragons. And I understand where that comes from. On the other hand, there are people who, who say Revelation is very literal. And um, everything is going to happen exactly as it is said, etc., etc. Um, I'm not willing to commit to either of these sides. And the reason for that is we're not told. There, there's no explanation that this is literal or this is metaphorical or whatever. It just presents it. So I think it's worth exploring uh, what, what maybe is a metaphor, what maybe is going to be a little bit more literal. And looking at that, especially as we look throughout Scripture to see when this language is used in other places, is it speaking metaphorically or is it speaking literally? Um, and frankly, God can treat this however he wants. If God wants to take this literally and there's going to be a real dragon, who am I to tell him that he cannot do that? On the same, in the same vein, if this is all metaphorical and that's how God has decided to communicate, again... Who am I to tell him that he can't do that? So that's my stance on this. And as we go into this imagery of the dragon, um, there's a lot of questions. It's like, are they talking about a real dragon? We'll see. I, I can't give you an answer on that, but I can tell you some of the symbolism with how it is described. Because when we speak of this great dragon, the reference is to Satan. That is the connection that is made, and that is consistent across all, all denominations, all, almost all interpretations. As they read this, this is connected to Satan, to the destroyer, the deceiver, the accuser, the angel of the abyss. And as we go forward, it's the dragon's described as having seven heads. Um, and this refers to a deceptive claim that he is God. This is seven is God's number as you go through Revelation and as you go through the entirety of Scripture again and again and again. Seven is God's number. It's a number of completeness, of holy completeness. Um, so as we see this, this dragon with seven heads and seven diadems, what we see is the dragon wants to step into that place of God. And it's it's putting this is where that clarification I mentioned earlier, it's wearing diadems. This isn't crown, this is a different word that does have that connotation with royalty. This dragon is is trying to step into that place of authority and claim that he is God. And he is not. But that there's this deceptive claim, and then it talks about ten horns. And when we're thinking about this description, I think the temptation is to say, um, horns. But I think... Uh, uh, more clear understanding is when we're talking about horns as opposed to or in relation to ancient armies we're talking about uh symbols of authority that were used to call troops together to command them in certain ways so when we're talking about ten horns there's this connection with a a supreme level of authority and command and then as as we kind of wrap this all in a bow we're talking about this great dragon and it's a great red dragon and the reason for that i'm sure you can guess the human association with the color red is murder and violence and bloodshed so th that's all the connotation and that's all the symbolism that is wrapped up in how the dragon is described and so here's here's the first conversational piece the discussion i guess that i have for you that is going to be dropped in the comments below this video is how does this deceptive claim to power manifest itself in our experience? So as we as we go forward um, in in our daily lives, what are some ways that that Satan, or in in reality, what I'm getting at here is anything that's not God. How does that claim authority in our lives? How does it make itself look like? It has the authority that really belongs only to God. So that, that's the first question I have for you down below. I would encourage you to, um, if, if you feel so led, pause this video right now and go and let us know what you think and, and further that discussion and see what other people think. Um, 
because there are people watching this video, I'm sure, that have uh, a lot more applicable thoughts than I do, because there might be someone out there who's watching this who is closer to your life situation than I am. So I would encourage you to look at that. Um, as we go forward through these verses, though, we have his tail swept down. And as we talk about his tail swept down a third of the stars of the heavens and cast them to the earth. Um, which, again, sounds very symbolic. But if we go back through Revelation, again and again, when we talk about stars, they are symbolically used to refer to angels. So when we're talking about the dragon, who is the devil, sweeping down a third of the stars, what we're speaking about here is, is fallen angels. This is the devil pulling other angels with him out of heaven that have joined in his rebellion, that have tried to step into that position of God. Um, and the question may come up, you know, why one third? It's, it might be literal, it might be, but it's also, it's a good, I guess, balance, it's a good symbolic number just for saying this is a sizable majority. That the majority of the angelic host did not rebel against God, but it wasn't only one or two. It was a significant number. So it's a significant minority of the angelic hope has been swept out of heaven. Um, this is the only biblical number that approximates the number of fallen angels. Do with that bit of information what you will. Um, and then we go forward and it talks about uh, she, the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gives birth to a male child. We focus, this, the devil's focus is on the child at this point. It is not on the woman. The woman bears a child that will deliver mankind. So the devil's goal is to attack that child. And as we go forward, the only reason that he turns his attention to the woman, to the church, is because the child is beyond his reach. Um, and, and that's where we're going from there. We're going to, the child is caught up and brought up into heaven. The child is the Messiah. If you go back into the first few chapters of Revelation, this, this description that we have here about, um, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That language is the same language that's used, if, if you go back to Daniel, but also more recently as, as we speak to the church at Thyatira, this is the language that's used to describe the Messiah. So what this is, is this is saying the child that the woman here is giving birth to is the Messiah, is Jesus Christ, Son of God, etc., etc. Um, and, and, and Jesus is snatched up. Now what this does, as far as this timeline that we're talking about, we started with the fall of the angels, which is before anything that we're aware of, and then we continue. And when the child is snatched up, we're, we're probably speaking to Jesus' ascension into heaven. And so what that does in our timeline, this jumps a huge amount of time, and it skips most of Jesus' earthly ministry. And the reason for that is John, who is the author of Revelation, is more concerned with the final outcome. Because the point of Revelation is it is not another gospel. The, the Revelation is saying here is the finality of Jesus' work. Here is the culmination of these thousands of years of God working in the midst of his people. Here is where it ends. Here is where the new creation uh, comes into play. Here is where Jesus comes again. Um, so that's what we, we see Jesus being taken up out of reach of the devil. And then the church, the woman, flees to the wilderness to be taken care of God. Taken care of by God. And it says there's 1,260 days. There are those who take this number very literally. But if you, if you look at the context and if you look at the way that this number and other equivalents of this number are used, the likelihood is that this is speaking to the number in Daniel that's called three times and a half a time, or a time and a, time and a half of time. Um, this is speaking to the church age, where God is with his people in the church, ministering in the gospel, bringing people to Christ. But it's probably not a literal length of time. We're not like counting down until the church age is up. 
which is something people try to do, but Christ says in his ministry, no one but the Father knows when, when the second coming is going to happen, when the world is going to end. So if he said that, he's obviously not giving us a literal number to start counting down from. Um, so that's, that's what we have here, and we're going to continue to move forward into Revelation 12, 7 through 9. Um, and if you have been part of the in-person classes, this is where we're picking up from those. Last week, we covered these first six chapters of Revelation, or six verses of Revelation 12. So we're picking up here. And we see, Now a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, and the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So that's what we have. Um, Michael and his angels. We're talking about this section where there's a war in heaven. This is where Satan stands in heaven accusing the saints. Accusing God's people who have died in the faith who God has brought to heaven. And Satan stands accusing them. And that, that's where Michael steps in at the authority, at the request of God. Um... And people will get into the mythology of angels. Uh, Michael is an archangel. This is not explicitly declared here, but he is clearly a leader. Uh, the language that is frequently used is he is a captain in the heavenly armies. Um, and ultimately, he expels the devil. The devil loses all the capacity to uh, accuse and, and try to condemn the saints that are in heaven. This war was, again, at God's command. And... With Jesus' ascension, there was no longer any room in heaven for Satan. Because at Jesus' ascension, he goes to the Father and he says, I have paid for the sins of my people. The devil can't accuse anymore because the tab has been paid. The redemption has taken place. Um, so this, when we're speaking of this, this is an ancient struggle and we're seeing the finality in the midst of Jesus' ministry. Um... So now we get to this, this joy that is, there is no one left to accuse us. We who are faithful, we who are people of God, when we die, when we go to heaven, there is no one left to accuse us. No one to tell God that he should throw us out. Because Christ has, has secured our place there in heaven. Um, the accuser was thrown out. As we go forward, we're going to get to... Revelation 12, verse 10, where it says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has, was thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives, even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So nothing was withheld fighting the devil. He is cast out. He is gone. But what we see here now is that the world will suffer under the assault of the devil until his time is up. And we are promised here that his time is short. But his time is here on earth, and, and they're suffering as a result of that. And we can make this connection to people ask, well, why are there natural disasters? At the time of this recording, there's the, the COVID-19, the coronavirus going around, and people ask, why does stuff like that happen? And the truth is, the world is, is broken, and it's suffering under the assault of the devil and the brokenness of creation. And that's something we have to suffer with for this time, but we have joy in the hope that it, it's not going to last forever. We have joy in the hope that we are redeemed, we are forgiven, and we have eternity promised to us. And we're going to continue going on. We have Revelation 12, verse 13, 
and says, And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had been given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle, so she may fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, and times, and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So we see the devil now pursues the church. He cannot win heaven. That has been made painfully clear to him and to anyone else. Um, so he strives against the church on earth. He strives against God's people on earth. Um, this is vengeance or like a petty revenge kind of thing, which I think as humans we can really identify with. Because if someone beats us soundly, a lot of times the temptation is to kind of dig at them some other way. Um, and a, an example from when I was younger, I, I played tennis a lot. Um, and occasionally... I, more often than I'd like, but occasionally a guy would come in and he would just thrash me. Um, Pastor Steve is one of these guys. The first times we played, he beat me, I think, 1-6-0-6 or 2-6-0-6. He just whooped me. And when I was in high school, um, I didn't enjoy this experience. I mean, I still don't enjoy this experience, but in high school, I was a little more petty about it. Um, so I would do things like if I, I would leave, if they had brought the tennis balls, I would kind of just leave them off to the side so they would have to make the extra trip. And it, nothing like serious, but I wasn't going to go out of my way to help them after they had just whooped me. And I think what we're, a lot of us can identify, I hope that's at least a lot of you, some of you watching this video can identify with that. Otherwise, I just made myself look like a punk. Um, anyway, that's what's happening here. God. <laughs> God has taken heaven away from Satan, and he's almost throwing a temper tantrum on earth. He is lost. He knows it. But he is, uh, he's clearly upset by that fact. Um, so, as we see, he strives against the woman, against the church, and God stands up for and protects the church. He, he lifts them up, he takes them away, lifts up on eagles' wings. Um, and then we have... The serpent poured water out like a river from his mouth after the woman. There is suffering. There is struggle. God has promised to take care of us, but in, in the midst of that, we still, we still have these difficulties. Satan is still pursuing us as members of the church, but the church isn't swept away. The woman isn't swept away. God hears her cry. Um, and then the earth opens up, and the earth itself takes part in this protection. This is miraculous protection. Um, and then the devil became furious with the woman, went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. He re refocuses his attack again and again on the church, on, on the children of the woman, the church, the faithful. And that is, that is where we end Revelation 12. Um, and as we go forward, uh, we will continue to do these video lessons. Um, and next week we'll get to Revelation 13. But before I, I conclude, I want to leave you guys with, with two questions. One of which is going to be a comment under the video that I, after the video concludes, I would encourage you to go down, comment, discuss, see what other people have to say. Um, and that is, how does the devil attack the faithful today? Because we frequently don't see it in, in possessions or in things randomly bursting into fire, or all of these kind of things that we claim are, are more the realm of movies than they are of reality. But I think the attacks are still there, and I'd be interested to see where you see them, whether in your daily life or in, in the world around us. And what I don't want this to become is I don't want this to become um, a bashing of the world around us or, or a attack on the world around us, but I, I would like our motivating 
force here, our motivation here is what is the word I should have used was motivation. Our motivation here is where do we see the world suffering because of the attacks of Satan? Where is Satan preying on the weak and, and those who are, are struggling with their faith or who are not in the faith? And how can we support them? How can we build them up? So I want that to be more of our motivation than, than some sort of self-righteous, here's where the devil's working in the world. Um, no, I think this should come more from a place of love. Uh, that, that's what I think our Lord would have us. And the, the final question that I have for you is this. And this is not going to be a question below because this is a question for you, for your reflection. And then it's how do you comfort yourself in the midst of the knowledge that this attack by Satan is directed at the church, is directed at the faithful? That's a difficult thing to contend with to know because we are servants of Christ, because we, we have faith in Christ, we are targets. So I want you to think a little bit uh, on maybe what scriptures can be comforting to you, what prayers can be comforting to you, what songs or hymns um, or people. I just want you to, you to think for a little bit, what is your support structure? Because I think if we think about that for a second, it makes it easier when we need it to go to it. So that's, what I, that's the reflection I want to leave you on. Um, this has been Revelation 12. Put on, this is hosted by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. We will be doing these video lessons at least as long as our campus is closed. Um, but depending on the response, if you guys like these, especially if you're unable to attend our regular lessons, um, let us know. Whether that's in the comments or maybe even just giving the video a like, let us know. And I will do my best to keep putting videos like this out. Because I'm doing the Bible study prep anyway. So this is just a little bit of extra time. So um, let us know if you like them. Please get into the discussion in the comments below and see what other people are saying and contribute uh, of your own. And that's, that's what I have for you today from Revelation 12. Uh, brothers and sisters, as always, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.